We are excited and honored to have Professor Stephen Carpenter with us. And this is the first of a series of events. I'm Larry Suskind. I'm on the faculty in Urban Studies and Planning. It's interesting to me that several people here have a water interest, several people here have a planning uh, interest, several people here have a artistic or arts methods interest, several people here have a sort of public education uh, interest. Um, and, and all of those uh, are uh, alive and well in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning in different kinds of ways. There is an environmental group in the department uh, that I have had some responsibility for. And water is a concern within the environmental group, not just domestically, but internationally, which relates to part of your work. We're interested in um, water as an environmental justice concern, not just a natural resource management concern. And so uh, when I uh, first learned of, of some of the ways in which your work has focused on making um, clean water available to people in different places, there was a direct connection with that aspect of, of what we do. I was really interested in um, how issues of race could be uh, raised uh, in a way the conversation was possible. And that is another very big part of what our department uh, and our school are interested in. So uh, by way of background, those are some of the thematic interests uh, that um, led us to very much want you to be here. Well, thanks, Larry. Uh, as far back as I can remember, I like making stuff. I'll just make things, you know? I'm the oldest of four boys, and the oldest and the youngest were born five and a half years apart. No twins. So we were constantly together and doing things, and we would make things, um, like a set of golf clubs. My dad had golf clubs. We weren't allowed to use them, so we made them. Of course, we used his copper pipe for the, you know, <laughs> the plumbing in the house. And uh, so making things was always part of what what I did and, and have done and just engaging in the world, and it shifts and it has moved. My background is really pottery, it's really ceramics, touching the clay, touching the mud, making things. Uh, that's my degree, is, is in ceramics and, and fine art. I don't know what it was, this urge, ability, interest uh, for teaching, for education. So that complicated the situation, making stuff and teaching stuff. Well, actually you can do that. It's called being an art educator or a teacher. And the ceramics piece stayed with. I couldn't shake the clay. I couldn't get the clay out of my fingernails. The making of things had to always be there. Um, and then I taught elementary school art. I was the art teacher in elementary school. And that was among the most invigorating experiences of my life because the students are always about making something. Their bodies are always moving. They're constantly in a state of absorbing what they're doing in the world and seeing other people doing and moving and checking. And so that energy was, was quite interesting to me. Followed that experience up uh, with a doctoral degree in art <coughs> education. But the idea was that the making and the teaching and the learning and the asking of questions through art, through the visual imagery that you're talking about, that was what was so important. And you mentioned the notion of access. Well, we didn't have golf clubs. We didn't have access to, we, have, we saw them, <coughs> but we didn't have access to them. So making our own access, I'm interested in that as well. How does one make one's own access? So moving around to a series of different uh, universities um, as an art educator, still making. Part of my graduate, both graduate degrees was about being in the clay studio as much as it was being in the seminar room. And that was really the, the focus of my dissertation was in the clay studio we were talking and critiquing about color and shape and form and how the glaze works and on the other side of the same part of campus, on the other side of the road, in the theory classes in art education we were talking about postmodern theory and feminist theory and film theory and interpreting installations and, and, and performances and then on the other side of the road. I'd go to my class the next day. We were again critiquing, but we were talking about, oh, I like, I like that handle. Show me how you made the handle. This handle works and that one doesn't. We never defined what works meant. But putting those together, the making and the interpreting and thinking and theorizing um, in both registers doesn't have to be separated. So to think of us even with labels, I find kind of curious. Like we, we have to find a place on campus, but to, to understand that we can move in and out of those spaces and we can start to shed those, uh, those identities. The kind of group that has 
self-assembled today speaks to multiple interests that I have and, and trying to weave it into what is an art education, how does one learn through the making of things, through the, through the display of, 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 of cultural pr uh, products, through cultural production, um, what kind of questions can we ask? Not just about what someone else has made, but what kind of questions can we ask through the, the act of making itself? We can make meaning through relationships, we can make meaning through um, conversation, we can make meaning through uh, verbal or written uh, responses. So it's the, the making uh, of meaning, making of cultural product, making of a difference, right? So this notion of making doesn't have to always have this physicality to it. I'm saying all that to say the, the clay left my fingernails for a while until moved to Texas my wife uh, is an engineer, me mechanical engineer, material science, and it was a great opportunity for her to move there. For me, there's no art education there at all. They, they got my CV and didn't know where to put me. Sent it all over campus, and finally the education folks said, oh, we'll take him. It has education in his degree, we'll take him. I'm telling you all that to say, I got to Texas, and art education had to be, I had to reinvent it, or at least I had to figure out what I meant by it and how I fit in. If you don't have an art department, how do you have art education? Well, you just open the studio in your garage and have people over on Fridays. I did that. Or you can engage in the work in the curriculum, that fixed set of, of notions and, and premeditated concepts, terms, practices, skills, construct uh, that educational experience. My entrance into uh, a, a more curriculum and instruction space was through my background as an artist and as an art educator. The water filter work that I do and have, have, have started to do uh, came about when I was in Texas. I met a guy who, uh, his name is Oscar Munoz. Oscar uh, is in charge of um, the, the Texas A&M Colonius programs all along the border. Texas is a third the width of the United States. So that distance and then 150 miles up is called the border of Texas. And in that space, there live over half a million people, most of whom don't have access to clean water in their homes. And Oscar told, you know, let me know this, and, and he, he works with um, communities all across that swath. And as an art educator, that was interesting to me because I had to learn about a lot of the practices that, that he, he's up against and, and faces. I'm telling you all of this to say, I'm not that I, I planned where this is go where my, my, my work has gone, but it, it's always migrated, always moved and shifted to new, it's, it's almost like water. Water finds its own level, right? Water fills the, this, the, the, the vessel in which it's, it's poured. But I've never lost the clay. I've never lost that notion of making or the ways that uh, meanings can be made and understandings can be constructed through engagement with other people. That's what education is. It's, it, it's a social uh, space. Teaching and learning is a social space. Art education can take up and take on those, those tasks as well. The title for this visit that people have seen and that you gave us is making something from nothing. Uh, and first of all, sort of there's immediately doubt <laughs> about whether you can actually make, I mean you can transform things, right. but the notion that you can make something out of nothing would sort of defy most of the laws of physics presumably. Yeah. Um, and so you mean something by that. And then appropriate technology as intentionally disruptive responsibility. It is a mouthful, that title, isn't it? I, I actually had a lot of trouble with it. <laughs> <laughs> to the left of the colon, making something from nothing, that piece was intentionally provocative, right? I mean, you, you kind of have to do that uh, in some ways to in entice folks to show up to certain things, maybe. But the idea of making, of course, you know, defying the laws of physics, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. So know, you know, knowing that there's a problem with, with that, if we think of it in certain realms, the idea that there are some folks who don't necessarily have access, it's about access. Maybe it should have said, you know, making something from whatever it is that you have, right? right? But if we move it to nothing, you start to think, well, there's a, there's a, there's a complete and utter lack of something. For example, there's some people who have no access to clean water. We can raise a bit of hyperbole there and say they don't have access or they have nothing. Uh, there are folks, you know, who uh, we talk about food scarcity. We talk about folks who, uh, homeless folks, and need shelter. I mean, so you can take minimum and exaggerate it just a little bit more, right? This thing called artistic license. Let's let's use that and turn it into nothing. 
Um, so making something from nothing, what can we make from what is available to us? So that's the something from nothing. And in, in the case of this first visit, the something is adequate access to clean water. And the nothing is the lack of that. And uh, the something is a response, which would, in this case is a ceramic water filter made out of clay and sawdust. The nothing is, well, that's just clay. It's, it's just in the riverbed. That's, that's nothing. Or that's just sawdust. That's leftover scraps. That, that's nothing. Right? You, see, you understand that play that's going there. Appropriate technology is essentially whatever is available culturally and locally um, that fits in with the, within the cultural practices of, of, of a community. Introducing um, uh, an external or an unfamiliar substance or um, uh, chemical or food is not appropriate to certain community because it's, it's either against one's religion, it's against one's history, against one's culture. It, it doesn't fit in. So finding something that's appropriate. For example, clay is essentially a material that is accessible to almost every single culture in the history of, this, of the world. And clay is a natural, naturally occurring um, uh, material in most places around the world. In some places using plastic, oh, that doesn't seem to make sense, or appropriate technologies using what, what is at hand philosopher, theorist, Umberto Eco. He, he was a guy who knew everything, but he didn't know it. Eco had numerous theories. Among them were this in, uh, theory of intentions. When he says the, the artist or the author has an intention, and the viewer or the reader has an intention, but he also says the work has an intention that comes about through, through a process or a series of, of events. But this idea of having an intention means it's deliberate. So I'm, I'm interested in, 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 t in thinking about why we're doing what we're doing. That's, that's where that intentional piece. Disruptive, you know, if I picked this up and I threw this water at the camera, that would be disruptive in a number of ways. Or if you're in a, in a, in a quiet uh, library and a stampede of aardvarks comes through the space, that's disruption, right? So we understand disruption as something that is abnormal or not expected within a particular context that has assumed rules, regulations, and ways of being. But I'm also thinking of disruption in the intentional sense of, to reveal or to poke at or to engage or, or to entice a certain kind of conversation or relationship. And that kind of conversation or relationship is the responsibility. Would you agree that most educational efforts are disruptions aimed at fulfilling a responsibility that is defining education that yeah. way? I don't think enough of them are. Oh, you think they should be? Though. I think they should. I like to, to shift that up and, and, and question that. And, and there's, there's, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to get at new ways of doing something without disrupting a status quo, without, without questioning it. We say it's because we're responsible and we have to disrupt, but what about the choice of the people in the place whose lives you're disrupting? Is that fair to them? Sure. Yeah, no, it, it, certainly the way you frame it, it's not fair to them. But in the disruption of the lives of, of, the, of communities that I mentioned in, in Texas is not disrupting uh, uninvited. It's an invited disruption. And second, um, the disruption has to do with whatever the current practice was, need, was not fulfilling or, or responding to needs of, of the community. In their eyes. In, in, in their eyes. Uh, and in, you know, soon my eyes as well. So my friend, as I mentioned, Oscar, uh, who uh, for years ha has been working uh, in, throughout South Texas, when he learned of the work I was, uh, that I was, you know, at that point still learning how to do, he said, oh, there's, uh, there's a water issue. Would you come down and work with us, talk to us? Let's see if this would work out. That was my invitation to come in. Oscar was already part of that community. I would never imagine just driving down there, driving to any community, and say, hey, I have something you need. I'm going to sell you something. That's not my approach. And, and so that kind of disruption, I think, is on the, uh, the unethical side. He was a bit wary of someone coming in. And he, he's, he shared, and other people have shared stories with me of, of researchers going into communities. Oh, yeah, I have this idea. Let me study what you're doing. Let me work with you. And they take the information. And there's a report that's promised and the report never gets back to the communities, or the results never, never help. And he said he, has never, he had never seen a report come back uh, f based on the invitations to the scholars. And so once we got to know each other, um, he felt comfortable with me. So, but then he had to go through a process of 
talking with uh, members of the community to say, hey, here's, you know, have this friend so coming down. That's the, invita that's the invitation right. piece. So what does an invitation have to consist of for you yep. to be of a sort that you're comfortable then responding in this r disruptive way? You need a vote of the community. It has to be 100%, uh, majority rule. Uh, people you like say, come on down. What, 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 what is in your mind about what legitimizes these kinds of disruptions? Again, it ha there has to be that, that imitation from someone who is, is positioned within the community. Then there has to be, um, for me, a conversation. And, and so, no, the entire community, because Defining who is in the community is often difficult to do anyway. Um, certainly, it, it's, it's often just a, a leader or, or so, a member uh, of the community who might want to engage a conversation um, uh, that, that then might expand in their own circle. In this particular case um, in Texas, through my colleague, we met with a few uh, leaders, people who had worked within the communities as, as promotoras, as, as, as community educators, um, uh, and, and other uh, senior members of the community. S senior meaning they had been doing work uh, at the community centers. And it was, let, let's just talk. Let, let's see where the conversation goes, very much like what we're doing here, having, having a conversation. Now, it's not my role or position or personality or interest to push that. After that conversation, that's on, that's on whomever to, to take that up. So when, when I speak of community, it's, it's, it's not the entirety. There's not a simple answer to this. We all struggle with this notion of the artist as an independent thinker, as a creator of something that's an expression of an individual view. When you're calling this a form of art education, but isn't it contrary to artists being artists? How is it art? Yeah. <laughs> So that's not a small question, <laughs> it, but it's a very important question. It's a, it's a central question that I've, I'm still answering for myself. Um, but there are, there are three uh, realms here. One is the work in uh, South Texas that I actually wouldn't call that art or art education. Oh, okay. okay. Second is the kind of work that I will do tomorrow, the performance. Um, and that moves into the realm of social practice. And that's where um, I've, I've come to an agreement, understanding, comfortable place with myself, that that's where the art education happens. Um, and then this, there's a third piece, your definition of an artist and what an artist does that I want to disrupt. Down in South Texas, that kind of work, for me, is not art education. It certainly uses and employs certain artistic practices. Folks who have access to a kiln, know how to fire a kiln, and have access to clay. That's where you want to begin your work. Um, usually that's the, the tile person or the, the pot, potter or it's the brick maker. But my uh, collaboration and my involvement in that project, I wouldn't call that art. That was kind of me shed, you know, that, that helps to clarify that piece of it. So the work that I'm going to do, I will do tomorrow, I'm going to set up a water filter production facility in uh, one of the rooms downstairs and I'm going to make water filters. The idea there is um, to engage in a practice that somehow blurs what might be our conventional notions of art making, art practice, with practices from other disciplines. We're not quite sure where one ends and one begins. And it's supposed to remain in that uncomfortable space if one is thinking in that social practice, art as social practice register. If you can set up that practice as an engagement, as an ongoing set of activities where people can come in and out of that space, there's an educational component. Invariably, there'll be a question, hey man, what are you doing? That's an invitation right there for me to respond. So we can establish this conversation as a, as a relationship. You're not creating art, you're creating something that serves a function in response to the need of a client. You're saying, no, it's not art. I'm an artist and it's my social practice that you should observe here as art education, but the product of my artwork is not art. It's more than the filter itself. That filter is just one component of the, the work. The work being the performance. Education as experience, this notion of experience is where that education happens. For some of us, the next step is, oh, and I want to help a place yeah. in Africa or Latin America yeah. in a community make a factory yeah. where there are people 
now without me there capable of making more filters right. and maybe they can sell them for a small amount to be able to maintain the a community business right. the doing of all of that that seems to be a different realm it is yeah and i have not um worked closely with communities as you're saying to set up facilities although in, in south texas i did i helped lead the groundwork and that facility oh, is, is working <laughs> you saw pictures right but there are a number of groups who are doing the, the exact kind of work that you're, you're, you're mentioning. And it's not from an arts or an art education perspective. It is from that social entrepreneur um, realm uh, that, you're, that you're talking about. And I am very supportive of, of that piece. And that is actually an intriguing component of what comes out of uh, this, this work. It's that work um, that then has benefits in terms of health, economics, um, uh, self-sustaining uh, capacity that, that I find intriguing. And it's something that uh, can be uh, uh, attempted where it's not intended to be a money maker initially. It's intended to, to save people's lives and, and, and to respond in that way. Um, so I'm curious about the longer term with this community in South Texas that you're working with. Um, obviously it sounds like there's a really pressing need so these water filters can meet that immediate need. Is the long-term goal still to kind of get a more traditional grid water set up for them? Yeah, yes. The origin of the filters was that they were supposed to be a first response to natural disaster, mm. and they were not supposed to be long-term. They're point of use, temporary solutions. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for some folks around the world, these have become more long-term responses. What do you do when you're just starting out? What's your advice for how you go about getting an invitation? That's a tough one. I, I think um, sometimes it's, it's not about poking for the invitation initially. Sometimes you find ways to, to become part of uh, the community. At some level, that might sound like, oh, but you, you're really kind of manipulating, right? Because in the back of your mind, you're saying, okay, at the right moment, I'm going to spring the question. I'm going to get the invitation. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is being part of a community and doing the work in the community where the work that you're doing might be seen by folks who could invite you. Again, that sounds like it's you, you know, some sort of nefarious, manipulative uh, component, but not really. I mean, I think it's about continuing your work and staying visible, and the invitations come. There's a, um, uh, an approach called arts entrepreneurship that is gaining traction, and several universities have courses in art entrepreneur arts entrepreneurship and minors, and I think a few are starting majors as well, or have majors. Because these other groups are doing this kind of work, folks know about the water filter technology. It's starting to take off and people are collaborating, they're, they're, they're entering into that space. And what they're doing is they're, they're making available for their learners, K-12 learners, possibilities that they might not have thought. It's the curriculum work that I'm doing with, with teachers, I think, that becomes quite engaging. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you hope very much. Yeah, yeah. Hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.